I would like to give a short introduction to our keynote speaker, Véronique Vienne. Véronique uh, is and has been uh, an author published in French and English. She's written, she wrote about over 100 essays and articles about type, graphic design, architecture and communication. She's been an art director for major magazines uh, in the US and in France. She's also been a, an editor-in-chief for those magazines. She's a multi-translated writer uh, of books of design culture and general culture. One of her titles is The Art of Doing Nothing. I hope tonight she will still deliver a bit of work. <laughs> she's, been a, she's been a teacher at SVA and various schools in France, and we are graced by her presence this evening for her keynote address and our opening address for Paris at IPI 2010-23, entitled The Weight of the Ink. Give a warm welcome to Véronique Vienne. After this weightless experience we just had, my, the title of my presentation is about the weight of ink. I love the title, but I don't know what it, what it was about. So I decided to do some research and try to build a presentation around a title that I liked. It was a book by uh, Rachel Kaddish, an American historian. It's a book about, that takes place in this, a novel in the 17th century, at a time when people didn't know how to read and write, and they hired scribes to communicate with each other by, in writing. This picture here is a picture of a drop of ink dropping in a glass of water. And uh, so back on Earth, where things have a weight, even if it's a very small weight, I would try to uh, convince you. Okay, let's see. I will, I will try to uh, share with you the findings. Because when, when I had to build this talk, I had to do a lot of research. And I will share with you the finding of my research. And I hope you find it entertaining. By the way, it's a great honor to be asked to talk to you all. I'm incredibly impressed by your skills. Okay, this is not working the way I'm supposed to make it work. Okay. Can we have those screens in front working? No, maybe not. Maybe I'll turn around. I'm going to turn. So what is a weight? The first question was, what is a weight of ink? What does it weigh actually? And I did some research and found out that a drop of ink, well, depending on the size of the drop, is about a gram which is about the weight of a rose petal. And it's amazing that something so light, so weightless, so almost immaterial, has weighted so heavily on the culture, which is our culture, the, world, the Western culture, the culture of literacy. It was a major fact factor in the development of literacy because without ink, there would be no Gutenberg. There has been no, I'm sorry, I'm still trying to work the technology here. Okay. So, yeah. Next. This is it, okay. Little known fact number one, printing ink is actually paint. We all talk about the movable type, but in fact, Gutenberg spent a lot more money, time and worry developing the ink. He came from a family of jewelers and he knew about metal, he knew about uh, movable type, it was not such a difficult problem for him. But the ink was because he had to develop an ink that sticks to the metal plate, sticks to the paper, and doesn't bleed and doesn't smudge and, and so on. And I think he spent a couple of years perfecting the ink and he went into debts. And I don't know if you know, he, he eventually lost the business because he made so many, so many 
investment to develop the ink. Uh, eventually, what he, the solution he find, I have no hand to show you, but uh, left because I do the two. But it was to create a pad, and the, uh, there was part of the professional way to ink was to have someone with two the two hands with the pads, and it would be a certain technique to ink evenly the metal plate, and then somebody would put a piece of paper. And there was a man who was standing there with two metal two ink pads. Uh, the, the, also because he was a jeweler, he put some metal, some little specks of metal in his ink. And to this day, we don't know how he did it, but the ink that he developed was radiant and extremely black. Why am I going back here? I, I, I'll, I'll get the technology. <laughs> I still don't know where I am. Okay, a drop of ink, so this is a... Uh, Lord Byron said, a drop of ink could get millions of people thinking. But actually, I checked, and in 1450, at the time when Gutenberg was developing the, 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 his invention, there were uh, about only about 10% of the population in Europe uh, could read and write, and they were all male, of course. Only 1% of women, if that much, knew how to, to read and write. It turns out that the man we, who holds the pen, the person who holds the pen has a power. This is my little known fact number two. Power is in the hand of the person who holds the pen, who has access to the ink. Because women knew how to read, but they were not allowed to write. This is actually the title of the book. The, the, the weight of ink. In the middle of the 19th century, women in England could read, but they still could not, are not allowed to write. It's, it's something I didn't know. And of course, they read books written by men because only men could write, where knew how to write, because writing is not just a question of a technology, there's a whole uh, construction of, of your thoughts, and actually writing helps you think which is the reason why this is, this is so difficult to, it's, it's very different. We have a word in English which is literacy, and literacy means in French you say read and write. Well, read and write is very different. Reading is one thing, writing is a completely different skill. The Weight of Ink is a novel about a woman who has to impersonate a man and betray her master and get into a lot of trouble because in order for her to write, she has to pretend she's someone else. Don't just think it, ink it. I love this uh, remark by Mike Victor Hansen, who is an American writer who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. I don't know if you, if you ever read it. I think he, he wrote something like 50 million books uh, the copies of the book are going around, but he's a writer, and he knows that when you write something, you suddenly think differently about it. And it's true that the world that the man had defined up to a certain point was a, was a world uh, where uh, the fact that you could write helped you develop the way you thought uh, whether you write beautifully or whether you take little notes, you know, like, like on these pictures I have, the, the, I think it's a, uh, an opera, or whether you're an architect or whether you write a love letter to an admirer, uh, like the, in the case of uh, Oscar Wilde. All of those actions, when you put ink to paper, you change the way you think. I don't know how many of you here are writers or have tried to write and express their thoughts in writing, but they will know how incredibly demanding it is to write. Little fact number three, ink that dries promotes creativity, that dries fast. That was the trick. That was the thing that was so 
so interesting in Gutenberg is that he could do it fast enough because the ink that was available before that, you had to wait, you know, you had to write and then you blow on it or something and, and fan on it. But ink that dries fast is really the thing that allows you, allows your thoughts to follow your hand and allows you to get into a sort of a different space. Um, and that's why one of the person who nobody knows his name, Laszlo Biro, I think he was, um, I forgot where he was from. Yeah. Yeah, he's one of my heroes because he, he invented the ballpoint pen, which is actually what he did is that he took the ink that Gutenberg has de de uh, developed and put it into a pen that was, that was, it, that it could deliver the ink that, that is actually paint. The, the big point, the big, big, big eventually, the Baron Big bought the invention and make the, the big point pen. Uh, the big ballpoint pen, I'm sorry, I have trouble saying it. Um, and and, it, and it, 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 it's the fact that it was, the fact that it dries fast and the fact that it was 50 cents and that everybody had access to the, to the to could, could suddenly write uh, fast and have it have a, a ballpoint pen in their bag changed really everything because if you think about it, Gutenberg was writing for an, was was printing books that were read by an elite, but the big point ballpoint pen was av available to anybody that even people who were not educated and particularly women. Um, and and when in doubt, scribble <clears throat> is an expression that that helps me. Uh, I don't know if I, I carry a note like many of you. I'm sure I'm carrying a notebook where I scribble a lot of things in it, and I have a bunch of big in my in my bag. And I, I, each time I I look at it, I think without without that big ball pen, I would have to have an, an ink ink bottles and a pen, a fountain pen, you know, which leaks and put inks all over my bag. So regardless of gender, social status, or level of education, nowadays everybody can write. Little known fact number four, and this one is counter, counterintuitive in a way in our day and age, is that Handwritten information is perceived as being more reliable than printed matter. You may not agree with me. Somebody said, if I can, if I, if I can see it in printed, it did happen. But in fact, if it's written in the ink, if it's written by hand on paper, people will, uh, the, the reader will absolutely trust it better. It's one of those, those, uh, those things, and that's why ink is, is so powerful, because if you see it in ink, suddenly you are convinced, even su subjectively, you're convinced that someone was behind that, that statement. Writing by hand takes a lot of time, and studies after studies have proven that it activates, when you write by hand, it activates a part of the brain that uh, is connected to long-term memory. So when you write by hand, I have to stop holding this, I need both hands. Suddenly I'm talking about hands and I don't have hands. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, writing, by, uh, writing by hand, um, when you see demands that you be attentive to it brings out apparently what it does is brings out from from your deep memory a kind of intelligence that eventually 
informs what you write. And then what you write goes back to the, your long-term memory. And that's why instinctively, when we see something written by hand, we trust it more than something that's printed. Uh, things are changing, of course, nowadays a little bit because of our relationship to writing and to fake news is extremely important. But one thing remains is that this relationship between ink and memory is that when, when you, everything will be forgotten, when the paper on which the thing is written will be destroyed, eaten by rats or whatever happens to paper, there will still be a leftover of ink that will allow the story that is told to survive even the destruction of the paper or the parchment on which it is written. And that's part of what people do is that they put together whatever scraps of paper with whatever ink in it to put, put together uh, the, what really did happen. So the palest ink is better than, the, than the, the best memory, which is a Chinese proverb, uh, means that sometimes we think we remember, but we remember partially, or we, our memory is not quite as reliable, basically, as what is scribbled in, in, in notes. And that's why when we see something like that, we instinctively, I think, we do say, Whoever put down those comments certainly meant it. Can you imagine having a, a document be redacted, reacted, redacted this way by someone with colored, colored ink and comments on the, in the margin? I don't know if you know, but books in the past used to be uh, notebooks. Uh, in, in family, there was a, people, there was a Bible and the Bible was at big margin. I'm sure you know about that. And in the margin, different people, different generation would write comments by hand. And the, the, the relationship between what was printed and what was noted by hand in the margin was very alive because you use the, the, um, uh, the, the document, the, the the, the Bible was a, a, a place where what was written and by hand and what was printed were united and was a document. And the fact that you could write, by, write in books, I don't know if you, if you write in books, but I do. And I feel a little guilty because there's something so sacred about a, a, a book. But at the same time, if you allow yourself to write in books, your relationship to the book will become much more alive. Also, if you really want someone to read a word, cross it. <laughs> and I love the fact that recently we've had a lot of documents that, that, that are permanently redacted. Redacted is a word that has been in the press quite a lot this this in the last few months or few, few years because a lot of sick, sensitive documents are being shown to the press, but they are redacted, which means the ink is used to hide. As, and, and it's interesting is that the amount of redaction is really informative, it's more informative than what's written under. You know that this document was probably incredibly interesting. Little known fact number five. Tattoo is as old as mankind, almost. And there was a recipe for tattoo that you can read up there, which was, which was instinctive. You could really uh, make uh, ink for tattoos in a very simple way. And even though tattoos are meaningful because they represent a lifelong, a lifelong investment, a lifelong commitment. A great number of people with tattoo wish they could erase them. It's a trend. It's something that's happening now is that you change your mind. 
you, you write on your body, then you change your mind and you want to erase it. And actually what I've heard is that the, remove, the, the erasing tattoo business is almost as flourishing as the tattoo business. The, so erasing tattoos is a new phenomenon. Why am I going back there? I don't have to do that. Okay, inking your skin is permanent in more than one way. I read a lot of <clears throat> te testimony from people who have, who have tattooed themselves and they all said basically the same thing, which is that once you sign your own body with ink, it belongs to you. You take possession. You have a totally different relationship. I'm sure many of you in this room have tattoos and maybe uh, you know what I'm talking about. I don't have any. But apparently it's, it's a way to own your body. And the fact that you want to remove the tattoo, I don't want to think about what it means because it's probably a change of culture. Uh, and the uh, tattooing your face is particularly, of course, violent. And that was a practice in gangs. You tattoo your face. It's very beautiful, actually. It's scary, can you imagine the, the, the pain, which is part of the process, of course, and the, the beauty of the, uh, of the result of signing your own face. Of course, there are easier ways to sign your face, <laughs> short of tattooing their face, celebrity tattoo their portraits. But it's the same idea. I own that image. I own that body. I own that face. And then, of course, sell your soul. You have to sign on the dotted line. And I read that apparently if you run out of ink, you can use your own blood. It's legal to this day. You want to sign, a, you buy something, you uh, contract, marry, whatever, whatever document you sign, you could sign with your own blood if you run out of ink. But sell your soul, sign here. That dotted line is part of the what makes it uh, so powerful. Little known fact number six. Today, the permanent quality of ink, long seen as its main asset in the past, is becoming a disadvantage. One supply, ink cannot be removed without creating environmental damages. damages. Its residue cannot be composted. They are not biodegradable. Ink is indelible. If you want to remove ink from its support, you are running against the very nature of ink, which is to be permanent. But that's what's happening today. And decolorizing, that's one of the words, decolorizing ink is not an eco-friendly process. The essence of ink prevents paper and plastic from being safely recycled. We have to talk about recycling. It's really a, it's really a difficult subject matter because we're going to have to we have to we have to keep recycling. We think we we are recycling a lot more than we are because actually because of the ink, a lot of the um, material that we're trying to recycle whether it's paper or plastic, is actually not being recycled. It's being thrown in the dump. Because the decolorizing, the removing of the ink is a very dirty and very complicated and very costly uh, uh, process. And the byproduct of de-inking is a toxic sludge that most of the time ends up being buried in, in a dump. Some people try to use it as a fertilizer. Some people try to use it to uh, burn it, to create, to, cre to, to run uh, uh, machines, but actually uh, it's, a, it's a dirty part of the, of the business that is never discussed because people say, yeah, we could remove the ink, we could start all over again. But the fact, the fact that the ink once it's removed from its support, it has to go somewhere. And where does it go? It goes in the air, it goes in the water table, it goes into the food chain. Ink is permanent. You can't just make it evaporate. 
And the source of pollution nowadays are changing. Reading, which is the printed matter of the past, um, is only about 10% of the pollution created by the de-inking process. The cartridge that we uh, use to print in our home printers are definitely scandalously expensive and impossible to recycle. But they only represent about 20% of the pollution from ink. The real problem is shopping. The real problem is packaging. And we, have, we are going to have to face the fact that ink has been co-opted by, the, by the, the packaging industry. When traditional printed matter, such as books or magazines, are being dematerialized, packaging is actually a booming business. I'm sure you've noticed with COVID and everything, more and more packaging is piling up in our pantries and everywhere, and we we, we, we have to, to, we throw away a lot of packaging, uh, hoping that it does get recycled, even if it doesn't. And packaging is creating greater and greater opportunity for the manufacturing, but unfortunately, it's not being dealt with in a way that makes sense, because you boast about removing the ink and, and recycling the plastic, or recycling the paper, but actually, uh, it's so bad, it's all bad, because even, even though it's slightly easier to remove the ink from the paper, from the cardboard, it still has to be dealt with. It, it's, still, it's still present in the environment. Little known fact number seven for me is the fact that recycling paper product was a great idea that turned out to be bad. I don't know how many of you know about the, 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 the CCA, which is Container Corporation of America. I don't know if you follow their, their work. There was in the 50s, and from the 50s to the, to the 70s, they run a campaign to advertise the, the company it was a corporate campaign. Any of you know about Container Corporation of America? A lot have been written about them. Uh, they did wonderful um, advertisement, which I will show you. But basically, they invented recycling. They had the contract during World War II. They had the contract for um, uh, the, the army to package the supply and the food for the front, the, the, for the soldiers. And after World War II, they were left with warehouse full of cardboard. And before World War II, people were, went shopping with baskets, and they would buy things in bulk, and put it in their basket, or maybe brown paper bag, and take it home. And CCA, CCA came up with the idea that in order to use more cardboard, to put it in a smaller package and to create what, we, what is now a real problem, which is all those emballage, all those packaging that is, we don't know what to do anymore. And they actually invented the recycling logo. You can see there the president, Walter Pepke, the president of the company developing with a young designer, developing the recycling logo. And they would go out, instead of buying trees and instead of making paper pulp from trees, they would just go and recuperate the unsold newspapers and the thrown away cardboard boxes and re remash it and uh, recreate paper from it. And they were the first to, to, to develop the de-inking process. Packaging, as you know it, is so the brainchild of CCA. And they had a campaign called the Great, the Great Idea of Western Man. Now, I think today that would not be acceptable as a, as, a, as a title, the Great Idea of Western Man, which is that they would take quotes from famous people, old man, of course, 
and ask great, the greater designer of the time, old man, of course, to illustrate it. And this is only three of about hundreds of wonderfully abstract uh, illustration by the likes of Brodovich, Casson, Bayer, Chisholm, and even more, all those great designers, type designers and designer of the time. And what they did is that they created, they created a packaging aesthetic, which is still prevalent in, in our culture, which, is in, which, which came out of this uh, modernism adapted to commerce. And if you know, if you look at, at those, a few of those packaging, you can see that actually they are quite beautiful. They are, each of them is informed by the aesthetic of the 50s and the 60s uh, with circles and ovals and lines. And, and I don't know if you, if you are familiar with it, if you are American, American designers are still very much enthralled by this kind of, this kind of design. It's actually hard to move away from it because it's, it's, it's a period, it's a moment where modernism actually finds its way into the kitchen and into people's home through the packaging and the good design came through the packaging. Now, how can we today la label our product without polluting, without ink? Could we, for example, use soy ink, which is biodegradable, and do more minimalist aesthetic, have little labels, and move away from those very colorful, modernistic packaging, and do delicate little removable labels that we could throw away? It wouldn't be such a so bad to to de to de de ink. But unfortunately, soy ink, which would be the problem solver, it would be the way we could move. Soy ink it contributes to the deforestation of the Amazon. It's one of the crops that contributes to the deforestation of the Amazon for rainforest. So you can't win. If you use soy ink, you are damaging the environment. In the past, they had many different ways to inform the, the consumer of their product without creating uh, inking problems. But what can we do now? I think probably one of the things that will make sense would be labeling without polluting, creating attractive, reusable containers, tin boxes, and uh, I think we have to, to to think what, we, what could we do to prevent people from recycling, because recycling is a bad idea. We have to keep it. If it, it has ink on it, it should be kept. It should be, it should be permanent. Of course, labeling without polluting will end up probably being a certain version of electronic ink, which I haven't talked about today because that was the, um, that's another topic altogether. Right now, it's very primitive. Right now, those labels, you've seen them in department store, in uh, um, grocery stores. Or, uh, uh, they, they are actually spying device. On those images, you could see in the corner the little blinking light which actually takes photographs and actually uh, takes pictures of the people who approach the label and read their facial expression and so on. But it's probably the way it's, it's going to have to go. There is a, a trend now, which is the flexible plastic containers. We're moving away from the, the cardboard boxes and we are putting more and more product in paper or paper lined with plastic or plastic containers, like the one in the middle there, the fruit, fruit crush shop. And it's a great trend because it allows people to go into the store and touch 
and have the feeling almost for the product that they, because it's squishy, it's a little squishy, and it's, it's, it, it gives the impression that you are actually touching what you're buying, which is something you're not getting when you buy cardboard, uh, product package in cardboard. But if I were you, I would start collecting those plastic flexible boxes and packaging because soon we'll have to do without it. We cannot go on with the, the, the kind of practice that we have now in the supermarket with all those, with all those, um, those packaging. And we are probably are going to have to go back to something else that will, that will make those packaging uh, collectible because they would be from the past. We are just at the crest where the packaging is going to have to change. And, and you are probably part of the solution. You are probably going to be able to, to uh, come up with an idea better than what I, what I found. And a lot of the future, says Ray Bradbury, a lot of the future will be wrong, but just enough will be right. And I think that's the hope that we have. So reducing the, the carbon footprint of packaging will have an impact on the way we shop, will have an impact on the way we design product. And what I think is that the wonderful golden age of packaging is going to be over soon. We're going to have to do without ink on our packages. We are going to have, going to, do, have to do without disposable product with ink on it. That's not going to be possible to keep it. And so we're going to go from the typographical wonders that packaging often, often uh, produces to something very, very different. And it will change the way we really probably relate to product. But things have changed. We have, we've done without things that were central to our culture, we thought we were central to our culture, and we can, we can move on. I'm sure we can move on. Because the little known fact number eight is that work in ink will still be around long after the memories are gone. So we will, we will be able to keep those packaging as artifacts from the past. And as long as we keep them and don't recycle them, uh, they, will, they will be safe for the environment. And while this, this is happening, I've noticed that more and more designers, artists, graphic designers, or even type designers, are rediscovering ink as a medium rather than a, a, a mean to an end. Ink as a medium is informing the work of a lot more designers, probably because at the same time there's a dematerializing of the ink and there is a de-inking trend. And so now more and more people are looking at the ink and I'm gonna show you the work of designers who have ink in their blood and are, are using ink no longer as just something they take for granted, but as a way to explore different ways uh, of, of, of designing. And when I was watching the, 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 the quick calligraphy show, the abstract calligraphy show, I thought it looks very much like the way designers today work with ink. Okay, so I have a, a list of people. I'm going to show you their work, and I'm, I'm going to, ho hopefully, I'm going to, to understand how they, why ink for them is so important. Peter Bankov is a graphic designer who currently lives in Prague. He's Russian. He's educated as a sculptor and carves out gigantic letter forms. Even if they are small, there's something gigantic. He's incredibly prolific and incredibly talented. 
I think he designed three or four posters a day uh, using ink. By the way, I say ink all the time, and it's, sometimes it's closer to paint. It drips. It's, it's, it's subjective. What we call ink is subjective. In a way, what we saw before the, the presentation, uh, the, the calligraphic was, to me, was like ink. It was flowing, and ink flows. So the difference between ink and paint is uh, totally subjective. But what's interesting is that when you look at the, this is uh, the work of Peter Bankoff, when you look at the way we relate to the presence of ink is through the imprint of the gesture that created the form that we're looking at. And uh, looking at this image, I was thinking of cave paintings. Cave paintings is also very primitive two very primitive, probably, paintbrush. I don't know quite how they were working, but they were, what we can, the reason we love cave, cave paintings is that we can see the gesture, we can imagine, we can almost feel the gesture of the man, of the, of the women, or men or women, that pay, were painting those, those walls. And that's the same thing that works in this example with Peter Bankoff, is that we, Emotionally, we relate to him through the gesture that is revealed by the traces on the paper. And he goes on and on and on. He's, he's... And of course, it is not done. It is not like a Lascaux painting, like the cave painting is not done directly on the surface. It goes through the, probably the computer. He probably puts it on, on the computer and works different scale and different, and different tr texture. Here on this, on this image, we, we see two kind of ink, probably one which is ink with pigment in it, the black one, which is heavier, and ink with uh, dye in it which is a more transparent one. They're a different kind of thing. And one of the things he does is that he contrasts his, his messy drawing with beautifully calibrated t blocks of text. And that's always a pleasure to confront the gesture of the hand and the printed, the, the, the delicately printed typography. Benoit Bonne Maison Fit, sometimes called Benoit Bonne Frit, uh, is an independent artist who lives in the south of France and uh, is, is more of a storyteller. For, for him, ink is real, it's alive it, because it bleeds. Uh, he starts messy, he starts with a lot of liquid, liquid ink. And he's, he, he lets the ink do, write the, its own story. Uh, messy beginning, it takes a chance, but if somehow things happen, he let the ink design the posters. His hand follows the suggestion of the, of the, of the ink that he puts down. The, it doesn't. I always have the feeling that he, st that he start with a drop of ink that grows and, and tells a story, and you start from the, in, in, from the center of the drop of ink that grows and develop into a narrative. These are a lot of his different, different work, but he has this, you, you could see that, you could almost, I don't know if, if it, works, it works for you that way, you could almost, feel the gesture that he, he, he made, and how his brush or his pen or his um, moved on the surface of the paper to make it, uh, make things happen. And the, here is with students. We were thinking of the, the, the ink moving, the ink being, if, if you tattoo your, your body. What's interesting is, uh, look at this, the body language of the students who have painted their body, and suddenly they find a whole body language of ownership of their body, which is different with or without painting 
on it. This is like fake tattoos, of course. And this is two examples of the way ink is actually the imprint of the mind that moves along with the, with the brush or with the pen, whatever was used. And I think what we, when we see, when we look at these images, either we like it or we don't like it, but we suddenly uh, feel for the, 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 the movement that created those shapes. This is one of his creation. He st oh, you get the feeling that he started in the corner and then he went on and on and on and the, 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 the ink wrote its own story. I don't know if any of you remember David Carson. Uh, David Carson is still going great. He's, he's incredibly talented. Actually, I have the dubious honor of having fired David Carson before he was famous. Then, then he, he turned around. I was working in a magazine in the United States at the time. And then he turns around and became very famous six months after I fired him. So be careful who, who, who you fire. One day they will not even respond to your phone calls, <laughs> you know, because they'll be in a limo somewhere. So David is very talented. I really admire his work. He's a surfer and he surfs on the top of those pieces of paper. Ink is first and foremost a liquid medium for him. I don't know if you have collected beach culture or uh, some of the work of David Carson. And drawn letters from surf on the surface of grainy images. I think this is, this is relatively recent, uh, recent work. But he has all sort of different techniques that he uses. But one thing is sure is that there is actually a grid behind, I don't know if you see it, but there's a grid behind this am amalgam of, of letters. It, it's really uh, the balance of the surfer has to always find the balance. Uh, only one typographical rule seems to apply, which is to break the rule just like what we were watching earlier, there's a sort of a pleasure, a joy in superposing graphical, typographical form on top of each other. Uh, David Carson has one message and one message only, don't mistake legibility for communication. Except that, of course, somehow, David's name is always legible. <laughs> I think for, I, I really think that for, for, for David, one of the things he does so well is that he has no message. And he, typography is a way to hide the fact that there is no message. And I ask him, because we still talk sometimes, I ask him, what was happening on those layouts? And he said, well, you know, there's nothing there, so it leaves a lot of room for your imagination. Jocelyn Cotensin is a French graphic designer who lives in Brittany, in Rennes, but he's always going around. His work is organic. Um, you always feel it's a substance. Ink for him is a substance with a life of its own. What, what he does is those performances, he works with typography, with, with dancer, and with graphic design students, and with uh, art students, and they do actually uh, performances, live performances. And you can see again that he starts from the ink itself, the ink tells him what he wants to do, and you feel that these ink spots are actually uh, the, the element of a written language. You don't know what it is, but the ink seems to have a mind of its own. 
right here, right now. I don't, I don't think you could read it. Even I, who knows it's called right here, right now, I can hardly read it. Because of the effort you, you create, you, what you have to go through in order to read it puts you on the spot, I guess, and that's why it says right here, right now. But he creates type, typographical uh, forms that grows and that very much give the impression that they are alive from the, from the sap, like there is sap inside each letter. letter. And some of the, the letters that he creates looks like they've grown in the wild, just like an overgrown garden. I don't know if some of you know the work of Pierre de Chulot. Ink makes spoken language visible for him because he's a musician at the same time. And what's interesting about him is that he, he begins by tracing each graph freehand using black and ink, but very quickly he moves to the computer. Uh, he creates, in a way, fake spontaneity. He, he needs to go the, to the computers in order to uh, emphasize the coarseness, emphasize the naturalness of, of the form that he creates. He's very, uh, he spends a lot of time trying to conserve the, the gesture that created the original letter forms. But what, what's, what's amazing, this, for example, he told me he spent hours and hours creating this thing. It looks like he, he just scribbled it, but actually he spent a lot of time because it started as a black and white drawing. He has this fascination for spelling mistakes and I'm still trying to figure out what it all means because facilitation general, facilitation general, you have to say it aloud in order to know what it means. And I think it's because secretly he's against the written language, he's against literacy, he wants to bring back the oral tradition. And, and for those of you who speak French, this is all French, but you have to say it aloud to know what it's all about. He, he creates printed matter that subvert the very essence of literacy. He, destroy, he used literacy to destroy literacy because you have to say it aloud in order to understand what's written. Uh, another group is Forme Vive. I'll go fast on this one also. As soon as the ink flows, inspiration flows with it. It's a, again, the ink is the, the inspiration for this, this, the forms, and the, 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 the forms grow from the feeling of the liquid nature of the ink. And it's completely uh, natural. Because basically brush drawing and pen and ink drawing uh, promote the unconventional design solution. And if you start uh, with a brush in your hand, you never know where you're gonna end up. And they, they ride on that feeling. Loves capital letters. These are two, so Egalité Homme-Femme is a, is a poster that they developed recently. Capital letters allows you to allow them to, to let, it, let it drop. And I don't know if you, if you have ever uh, played with ink, ink shapes geometric and shape or shapeless lumps of black ink and with a certain sense of humor. It's like our brain is just like when you look at the sky and you see clouds, you see faces in the cloud. When you look at ink spot, well, this is a Rorschach's test. You start to see a story. And I think that's one of the thing about the ink is that the ink 
speak directly to our, the instinctive desire of our mind to see shape and to see, read a story and to see a narrative, even in things that are not designed to tell a story. Fanette Mélier, her father was a printer, so of course there is ink in her bloodstream. And what she does in this particular project I'm going to show you is that black ink is the sum of all colors. You know black is the sum of all colors. And she, she, she did an experiment where she printed this, this novel in black, which is actually three colors. Uh, the three main colors on top of each other, and what she does is she removes some layers to reveal some of the cover, cover, colors. And it's for her, it's as if the color was sipping from the, the, the gutter, from the center of the book, and <coughs> like, like, like rain penetrating into a building, the color is, in, is penetrating the book. I don't know if you do that, but I sometimes do it. I open a book and I put my nose in the middle of it to smell the ink. And I think that's what she, she is evoking there. Fanet's interaction with the text is fluid and random, like emotion that motivate the different character of the novel. She lets the color come in and out to inform or to give, uh, to give the, uh, the reader this sense of that the story is going some places. She tried the same thing with black and white. This is a very, this was an experiment layout of a book complaining, explaining how to tattoo oneself in jail. I hate to think of what you do, but you now we know how we do it, how to create tattoo in jail. So that's what she, that was a, the text that she, a detail of how she takes Text, let the ink inform the readers of how far you can push it and how you, how you read, how you, how you put together this, the, sent, the, the meaning of a, of a sentence by just scanning with your eyes. You can do that. Vincent Sardon, I don't know if his name is really Sardon or if, because he's very sardonic, sardonic. Um, like Gutenberg, he puts ink into pads and he creates pads that people, it's a commercial venture that people are, are collecting. Sardonic and, and uh, what the, the words that he uses, are, the specialty is to create, work, to create sentences that reflect the way one criticizes oneself, self-deprecating, they're all self-deprecating comments, and you stamp, when you can, you get to stamp your self-deprecation, and it's very successful. Spelling out the many ways we despise ourselves, stamping it out, your misgiving is the best way to get rid of them, and he's very, uh, successful with this venture, and he, he can even you can even stamp out your own Jackson Pollock or your own Andy Warhol, and even if you want a, a gift for a very special person, could be a kit of obsessive squiggles. Super terrain is interesting because they're working with ink on a very large scale. They inscribe their, their posters, their, the work they do, they want to look at it from a distance. Here is a, uh, for example, they stage their work. Here it's in Athens, it was a whole project they did, they did for a uh, cultural institution but it was meant to be seen from far away. They print on umbrellas, they print on flags, on parasol, on coats and dress. For them, the, the typographical and the color ink allows them to, to, 
to be part of a, of a landscape, in a way, to, be, to look at ink. We don't think that a drop of ink would actually could be seen from far away, but that's uh, one of the things about ink is that it spreads, and you can make a lot of, uh, you could create a whole environment with a very little ink. And I will end up with Catherine Zachs, who is a graphic designer, a typographer, uh, who lives in Paris. Her work focuses on the power of the hand. The paper that she that ha she happened to be in her studio on the finger, fi under her fingertips, and the quality of the present moment. She follows where the ink wants to go. And when I look, when I see that, what I see is almost the quality of the ink, of, of water in general, to have surface tension, as if the density of her composition resulted from the cohesive nature of the ink molecules that tend to draw toward the center of the image. And you can see that on the edge, on the edge of the, type of her le of the letters, she managed to the, the, the edge of the letter form, she managed to, to make visible the kind of process, you know, the surface tension on the edge of the letters. Or the drip, how a drip f comes down because of gravity, and then when the gravity stops pulling on the drip, the drips gather into a little, a little small sphere at the end. So she's very much trying to express with their design the very nature of the ink itself. She practices. This is, she, she's endlessly interested by what will happen when you do a drop of ink. And her, her dots, I didn't know that drops, Dots at tops and bottom, but apparently they do. There's a top of the the top of the dot and the bottom of the dot. The ink directs her hand. That 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 hold suggests where it wants to go. You could see that she did not try. She didn't try anything. She just let the ink do do whatever it wanted to do. Okay, we're almost done. Brush strokes are particularly loose. If you, if you write, that's why a lot of us love to write on top of newspapers, or on tops of existing pieces of paper that I've found, because it seems that ink loves to, to, to obliterate other uh, text. Brush stroke, obliterate text have a vitality of their own. And she does, she does absent-minded doodles, which are really the expression of the, uh, when I look at it, of the intelligence of matter. Matter has its own intelligence. And she does squish ink like that. Uh, it's an ink blot, it's, but it's not necessarily a Rorsha text but it's as beautiful as a Rorsha text. So I, I, I could, we could look at this image and, and realize that what ink does to us is that it speaks directly to our mind, speaks directly to our desire to see forms where maybe there is no form, but the form that is in our imagination land on an ink spot and blossom there. The weight of the ink. In an ecstasy of ink, every paragraph laboring, was laboring to outline the shape of the world. That's what I mean. It's from, from the weight of ink. By putting down ink, we call our mind to give it form. Ink attracts the, maybe the liquid nature of our intelligence, but there's a real dialogue between the ink spot and the liquid between our ears. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I think oh, what a way to start the conference, right? So I think that's whenever you reconsider why you're doing traveling and so forth to attend the conferences, I think that's the perfect answer to for that, like uh, for moments like this. Uh, so thanks so much. Uh, well, I think it was a delightful presentation. And uh, so I think also the irony also presented on the screen that is like digital rather than ink <laughs> for the topic. So. But yeah, th thanks so much. We are back here tomorrow by 9, and we have the breakfast by 8.30. So I know it's like a, it's a lot of things, like a lot of uh, uh, dinners, like uh, people like connecting, talking after such a long time. Uh, but yeah, make sure they're going to be here by tomorrow. It's like a second keynote speaker by early in the morning. And then see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.